Hi, Guilty Feminist. This is Deborah. Just before we start the show, my stand-up comedy show, Brand New Hour at Soho Theatre, runs from the 30th of November to the 5th of December. There's hardly any tickets left, so go to SohoTheatre.com and grab one while you can. I really love you to be there. Also, we're recording a live episode of The Guilty Feminist at Shakespeare's Globe, but the lovely indoor winter space as part of their Women and Power season, 6 p.m. on Sunday, the 12th of December. And our guest is Kathy Lett, the legend. Now, I'm very excited to tell you about this. Sunday, the 16th of December, starting at 7 p.m., not 7.30, The Guilty Feminist presents Camp as Christmas. It will be at the Union chapel in Islington. I will be co-hosting with Tom Allen himself. Our brilliant lineup of confirmed LGBTQ plus acts include Sandy Toxvig, the Queen, Grace Petrie, Jess Foster-Q, Jen Brister. There are other brilliant acts too, but there are some so big and exciting, I am not even allowed to announce them yet. All I will say is tickets are going to go soon. Get one now. It's a benefit for Say It Loud, run by and four LGBTQ plus refugees fleeing homophobic violence. And can do, Dr. Rola Hammond, who you heard on the podcast recently, alarming Syrian schools. Tickets are £25 or £15 concession. It is the most extraordinary lineup and it will be the best Christmas show this year. For all of these, check the links in the show notes or go to guiltyfeminist.com. And finally, we released a few days ago. Um, a podcast version of a live stream we did with Sarah Mardini and Sean Binder, who were two search and rescue volunteers who are facing trial this week for trumped up charges of trafficking in Greece. They're humanitarians. We need to support them. We need to tweet the Greek prime minister and tell him we will not stand for it. Please go to freehumanitarians.org All of the information about how you can support Sarah and Sean and the others who are up on these ridiculous charges will be there. Plus, you can donate to help their campaign. This is really, really urgent and scary. So please help if you can in any way possible. And now, the podcast. I'm a feminist, but at my dance studio this week, I went upstairs to use the loo and I walked past an open door and there was a man sitting on the floor with a circle of young teenagers and young women around him, and he was teaching ballet. I was watching a man teach ballet, and (laughs) oh my God, it was a man, and he had the energy of a straight man. I don't know if he was a straight man, but I think he was a straight man. He was teaching girls and young women ballet. So what was the bit that you loved the most? Was it uh, that it was a man teaching a traditionally feminine art form perhaps to girls or the fact that he was very bendy? It's beyond language. It's above language. Uh, (laughs) There isn't any way to articulate it. It's a feeling in my soul and my loins. Is it like you've gone for a a walk outside and then you've just accidentally found a swan and some cygnets and you've just become transfixed by the swan? It's beyond language and it's beyond nature. There's no natural equivalent or metaphor for this, Cal. Um, He was demonstrating things to them. He stood up and was demonstrating things to them and they were all looking up at him adoringly. It was the ballet. It was the man. It was the teaching role. It was the status gap. And none of this is feminist. Like all of this is very unfeminist. Like Um, why I see women teaching ballet in there all the time and I'm like, yeah, it's a ballet class. I don't think anything of it. It was just very sexy watching a straight man, I assume, teaching ballet. What I'm loving here is that you were talking about it the way I talked about seeing whales when I came back from whale watching. Like it was just so majestic. We didn't know if we were going to see one. It was just so beautiful. <laughs> um, it was slightly, it felt slightly dangerous. Uh, yeah. You know, what if he'd fallen and crushed you? Like, yeah. um, <laughs> um, and All also, of those things. Did All you of those things. End up, did you end up surreptitiously creeping into the class and joining the circle? It felt very inappropriate because they were all 17-year-old ballet dancers, so no. If I could have slipped in unnoticed in my leggings and T-shirt, sure, but these were 17-year-old girls in leotards with the figures of ballet dancers, so I would have been extremely off. It would have been like Stonehenge wandering in and thinking, maybe no one will notice me. No, no, obviously also, not. 
Also, you would have just made it into the circle and then you have to put your hand up and go, can I go to the toilet, please? Yes, that's the other thing because I was on Probably my way to the Probably just as well you didn't go in. But can I say on the plus side for me, that's the I'm a feminist butt side. I was like, oh, oh, the whale watching feeling. And you did find a ne- metaphor in nature. You did. You absolutely did. did find it. Thank you. Well done. I thought you wouldn't, but you did. Good work shopping, everyone. Never underestimate Cal Wilson. Um <laughs> She had another go. She thought, you, you can't tell me I can't. I'm a feminist. And she had another go and she nailed it in one. It was whale watching, although just in spirit. But on the way back, and this is in the plus box for my feminism, I didn't look. I was so <laughs> tempted to just look again. And I thought, just keep, this has nothing to do with you. It's not, why is this hot for you? And it's because I always fancied my teachers when I was a teenager, or my male teachers, um, oh. um, possibly some of my female teachers, but my memory of crushes is male teachers, never boys at school, always teachers. And you know how you really crush hard at that age? You know, yep. you, you, because your hormones are going crazy. Wow. It must have been like a, a miasma of hormones in that room. It must have been like a light fog just filling that room. Well, I think maybe that's what I could feel. I caught their hormones, their teenage hormones. So they were sort of <laughs> 16 and 17. He was this handsome, I don't know if he was straight, but he had a straight energy. What does that mean, Deborah? What does that mean? I'm a feminist, but what the fuck does that mean? But you know what I mean? I, yes. I, this is me. Judging a man as being somehow straight, I can somehow detect unbelievable, unbelievable behavior on my part. But it's that's why we have the conventional, I'm a feminist, but this isn't for the more noble parts of us. This is the ignoble session. <laughs> I assessed that he was straight from a doorway and assessed the feels of the girls. Not that you can't have a crush on a gay man by any means. Got crushes I've on loads of gay I've men. I've done it several times. Oh, all the time. It's a lovely safe crush, a crush on a gay yes. man. This, yes. Nothing about this felt safe. Nothing about this felt safe. This all felt very dangerous. I caught their hormones, which they may or may not have even had. And also I just had a sort of flashback to feeling something that intensely. Because as you get older, you feel everything less, I think, mostly. My feelings are much less deep than they were. As a child, I felt things so deeply. As an adolescent, I think felt different things very deeply. Every decade since, it's been much more. I've taken off a layer of skin, basically. I've had a layer of skin soldered off by life. Do you think that's why people that get celebrated in the paper for being 100 or 101 are always so serene? Like they've just stopped feeling anything about anything and they're just like, (laughs) all that I care about is cake. That's all I care about. Well, and, and trying to think up their proverb to tell everyone about how to live a long life. Yes, yes. They're probably thinking, oh, should I say making daisy chains or walking barefoot in the grass? What a load of bollocks. But I've got to say something like that. I've read it. Um, uh, I know that's what the kids are expecting. Something like, you know, connection, love. It's the only thing that matters. But for whatever reason, it was sort of like a kick in the stomach back to those old hormones See, I want to be particularly unfeminist now and ask you what he was wearing. Uh, he was wearing uh, like ballet men's leggings and like yep. a tank top. Um, but his he had a ballet dancer's body, obviously not well, not obviously actually. Teachers don't always, but he did. He well, looked like a masterclass. I feel that we have spent more time discussing this than it actually took. For oh, it to no, happen. much longer. Oh, it was seconds. Like it, was, the, it was seconds. It's the MASH version of, like, I think the Korean War finished far sooner than MASH did as a oh, series. Yeah. yeah, years earlier. Um, I'm a feminist, but the reason I really like wearing a mask isn't just because it's us taking care of each other when we go out. Mm-hmm. Uh, it isn't just that it's a signal to other people that I'm thinking of them as well as myself, the reason I really like wearing a mask is I haven't had to pluck my chin for 18 months. (laughs) What Do do you not do it for yourself slash your husband slash your child? This is the thing, right? I uh, I find myself just, uh, it looks like I'm concentrating, but really I'm just doing a sweep of my chin. I do that. Yeah, I've got four on one side, four on one side, three on the other. I have two there under here. That and do you f- I do fiddle with and try and yes. pull out. And then I have one now that's quite new that's there. Um, but this one is very loose. It comes out very quickly. I'm like a chin farmer. I'm like, well, these two aren't ready, but I'll ha- I can harvest this crop. <laughs> like I can get the left side if I can't get the right side. Oh, uh, God. And uh, I have a favourite bristle. 
I don't know whether you have a favourite bristle, Deborah, but no. I have a favourite bristle. Uh, and I also, very foolishly, my husband asked me what I wanted for my birthday and very foolishly I said I'd like one of those light-up magnifying mirrors. What a mistake. <gasps> what a mistake. Oh, I no. thought I had six chin hairs. I've got a thousand. I've got a thousand. Uh, and that is why I love masks. Are they very light ones though that you can't really see? No, they're the coarse ones. They're the, you know, the ones that you could use as a toothpick. Like they're kind of strong and long and black. And well, look. Coarse. There's no reason why women shouldn't have body hair. We're allowed it. Men have it. Why aren't we allowed it? I don't understand why we have to constantly be smoothing ourselves all the time. I mean, I do it because I've been raised in a patriarchy and I, so I prefer it. It's not my fault. That's my taste has been formed by power structures and now it is my taste. What am I meant to do? Like something I don't like? You can't like something you don't like. I guess I could train myself to like it by staying with it. Blah, 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 blah. It's quicker just to pull it out. Yeah, and for me, it's just that I fiddle with them. I fiddle with them. It's the same reason I don't paint my fingernails because I just pick. So if, uh, I left I the, if I left the hairs there, I'd be, I'd be naming them. You know, I'd be like, oh, that one's mm. Susan. This one's Angela. Like, I've got to get rid of them for my own, uh, <laughs> my own concentration. In Orange Is the New Black, Piper has one that she says she and her boyfriend used to call Spike. <laughs> uh, so yes. naming them, you know, is not not the way forward. I'm a feminist. But the other day, I, I had to get a taxi because of a previous engagement to an abortion protest for Texas, where I was speaking. And I told the taxi driver when he got me there on time to speak that he was a feminist hero and he should tell everyone that he was a feminist hero, his friends and his family, because he had got me there by going, uh, black cab drivers, they know the way in London, but by going a tricky back route against all the odds, he got me there 10 minutes faster than Waze said he would. And I said, you have to tell everyone, sir, you're a feminist hero. And I said that even though when he'd said to me, where are you going? And I said to an abortion march, he said, huh, sad business, lady's choice. <laughs> sad business, lady's choice. <laughs> and uh, can I add to that, Mandu Reid is a feminist who is the head of the Women's Equality Party. But when I told her that, she went, it's not the worst summation I've ever heard. She said, I've heard worse from men. <laughs> Sad business, ladies' choice. It's, it's a good T-shirt slogan. As she said, it's a bit reductive. And, uh, you know, there are various things with that. It doesn't include lots of different nuances. But it was such, it was his like four line summation. Bless him. Brilliant. But even though, even though his summation was extremely reductive, and uh, I won't be wearing his T-shirt. <laughs> I told him, sir, you're a feminist hero. He said, oh, I don't know about that. I said, I do. You have to tell your friends and family you're a feminist hero. You got me here on time. He was very pleased. I wonder if he told the next person that got into the taxi. Like, I, I wonder what the next conversation was like. It was like, I don't know where you know this, but I'm a feminist superhero. Yeah, well, last night I got in a cab really late. And as soon as I got in and we drove away from the house, this taxi driver just went, I was just talking to someone about the serial killer around here. And I went, what? And he went, yeah, back in the early 2000s, there was a man who went around here killing lots of people, old people, and then told me horrific stories. And he was like, oh. and I was like, uh-huh, why are you telling me this? But he hadn't said anything else. He hadn't said, are you having a good night or da da da, da or anything. That was his opening gambit. Wow. And I was like, uh-huh. And he was like, yeah, he wants to get out now. He, he's up for parole. I don't think they'll let him out. Do you think they'll let him out? I was like, I don't, I'm not really sure. Oh, oh, I've just got to do this quick email. I was so nervous. Uh, oh, but he was just awful. like, yeah, it was all around these streets. He used to go in and he used to kill people and do things to them and started telling me stories that I won't I won't share on the podcast because it's, it's triggering. But I was like, holy hell. I was like, why would you start? Why do you think this is a good subject for conversation when you've got a woman alone in your cab? I was like, no. It, it, it does sound like the start of a horror movie, doesn't it? Yeah. It's, you know, I was, was on a night like this, this 20 <laughs> years ago. Like it's totally, it's totally that. Um, now, this is not a planned I'm a feminist but, but I'm just going to say it. Um, I'm a feminist but as excited as I was to do this Guilty Feminist on Zoom, the thing that uh, I have loved the most so far is Tom Selinsky's sneaking behind you to put the cat out. <laughs> <laughs> and hearing the cat meowing and going, oh, there's a, nothing beats someone's cat walking across a keyboard in a Zoom meeting. 
nothing. No, I mean, it's great. But I, the thing is, when Tom locks the cats out, they cry at the door, and then I, I get so easily distracted by that that I can't think and talk, so I have to let them in. Um, I can't. I can't. I just can't. You're going to have to get um, cat flaps on your interior doors as well. I mean, that would be the dream, but then what's the point of having doors? <laughs> um, there's only cats in this house. I mean, the humans can open the doors. I am a feminist, but at the Texas abortion rally, it started to rain, and I said to my friend, oh, I mean, I've just had a blow dry and I've got no umbrella, so my hair's going to get wet, but no one cares about that. <laughs> no, there's, where's my protest? I mean, it was freshly blow dried, Cal. Freshly blow dried. I can't, I can't. Can you imagine if you've just literally had a blow Because I had another appointment that morning and that's why I had to be taxi to there for the earlier point. I didn't, I didn't, and I want this on the record, I didn't get a blow dry for a protest. Right. I didn't. But also, if you said that, if you said I got a blow dry for a protest, I would go, that's on brand. Like I would I mean, accept that as an answer. It is on brand, but it is on brand. And I might have, but I didn't. I got a blow dry for the previous appointment that was a, like a, you know, a thing I had to do that required good hair. The cat is now trying to get back in and I can't handle it. <laughs> Toast, come in. Come in or go out. She likes the door open. She likes the option. I um, found myself uttering the sentence today, hang on, I've just got to charge the cat's fish. Have you got a USB charger? What? I got it like a wiggling fish and it, it's got a USB charger so that it mm. doesn't run out of wiggle. Oh, we need one of those. <laughs> it's quite a weird, like a sentence that would make, all, all the words are in English, but if you'd say that to someone 20 years ago, they would be like, I don't understand what you're talking about. Five years ago, really. Five years ago. Someone said recently, can I plug in my book? No, I'm charging my cigarette. <laughs> um, and like saying like the future is so weird because five years ago we wouldn't have understood that or when, however long ago we wouldn't have understood that 10 years ago. Um, can I plug in my book? No, I'm charging my cigarette. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Um, I'm a feminist, but while I was incredibly excited to be doing an episode of The Guilty Feminist with you, secretly, I just want to talk about your magnetic eyelashes. Oh, yeah. Lola's I lashes. I mean, we've talked about them on the podcast before, so we probably don't need to talk about them, but afterwards I need to hear everything again. They're the new pegs, Cal. <laughs> Do you know, the thing, that I, um, the thing that I get the most on Instagram or Twitter is just people going, have you tried these, and then sending me a link to pegs, and I'm not angry about it. No, no, you shouldn't that be. Makes, makes me very uh, happy. <laughs> if you're listening uh, and you haven't, you were not listening at the point when Cal, when we were doing shows in Australia and Cal had a running a running joke. It wasn't even a joke. It was a running joke. Well, it was just a statement. It was a statement that my secret side quest of my life is to find the perfect peg. Yeah, I mean, I wish it were a joke. It was very funny, <laughs> but it was authentic that Cal was looking for the perfect peg. And then didn't you get Julia Gillard involved with the perfect yes, peg? Yes, she agreed with me. She agreed that it is a noble side quest to have. And then by the time we got to New Zealand, people were bringing pegs to gigs to give oh, me. that's and right. I mean, how you get food, you get beautiful cupcakes with um, suffragettes on them, and I get yeah, pegs. And that's I'm true. Very happy that's about true. It. I get cakes, I get books, um, I get tote bags with vaginas stitched on the side in embroidery. <laughs> I get, I get, I get posters. I get fan art, like you know, pictures of beautiful feminist imagery. Sometimes pictures of me. Uh, I've never once got a peg, but Lola's lashes are the new pegs for sure. In as much as I'm obsessed with them. But do you know, I found one, I think I might have said this on the Guilty Feminist the other day, but I found one on my door latch. Yes. But it's, but it's the door, it's the front door of the whole building. And there was one of my magnetic lashes and I was like, eh, maybe one of my neighbours found it and stuck it on there so I would see it. I don't know. They probably know she's the magnetic lash lady. They probably do. So, so two things I love about that. One that you said door latch, very similar to door lash, just a moment oh, yes. opportunity there. Lola's uh, latches. And, yes, absolutely. And also... <laughs> Also, maybe they just thought it was a caterpillar. You know, like if it was in Australia, someone would go, oh, it's just one of those caterpillars, like it's little true. hairy thing on the door. We have fewer insect crawlies, things that want to bite you here. Um, oh, Toast wants to go out now. Bloody hell. Okay, I'm just going to leave the door open because I can't handle it. Um, is that light's going to come in now? Hold on. I'm going to put the light out. Um when, yeah. When we when we return to live gigs, do you think? Because I think I feel like now that we've done lots of things online, we're kind of learning the, the aspects that we want to take back with us into society. 
Do you think it will become acceptable just to have your cats at live gigs and just have hope them wandering so. in and out? Yeah, I, I hope so because so, I think they have added overall. People love seeing cats. If I'm on a like a business meeting, you know, write out a script or something, if your cat comes into the frame, everyone's like, oh, my God. Like, you know, it's there's nothing yeah. that will break the ice or make it a more human call if it's a bit – Oh, hello, hello, never met. Uh, uh. If a cat comes into frame, suddenly oh. everyone's just entranced and just becomes really soft and open. Um, so I do think taking cats to meetings would be good. <laughs> We've started doing pet parades. If we, A couple of friends and I, if we do corporate gigs, we have a pet parade on oh, Zoom. Oh, that's so nice. everyone's- Everyone has a moment to hold up their cat or their dog or their snake or their lizard or whatever they've got. If they snake or lizard? No. Yeah, no, I've I don't had snakes and lizards. No, we've That's had them. A, that were, I'd, I'd, I'd ban those. <laughs> I'm very, I'd be very upset by them. I couldn't handle it. I'd be like, oh, it's going to come through the Zoom. Pet judgment. Um, Did not expect this. I'm a feminist, but I will judge your pets if they're reptilian. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> I, am, I am going to. I don't think a lizard is a reptile, though, is it? Yes. Is it? Is it? Yes. Or is it? What, what else would it be? I don't know. I just suddenly had a crisis of confidence <laughs> 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 that I'd, I had, um, I had misspecies, species. Uh, oh, it's going to be but, some no, really right. angry geckos. We're going to get right again. Emails going. from skinks. It's all over. <laughs> From a variety of bedrooms and kitchens via Zoom, the Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Cal Wilson, and our very special guests, Rochelle Panitz and April Elaine Horton, talking about checking in with our bodies. Woo! This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and our hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White. With me is Cal Wilson, and we are talking about checking in with our bodies. Cal, how often do you check in with your body? Um, I reckon I every time I get out of the shower, I look at myself and take stock. But I don't know whether that's the same as checking in with my body. I think... Um, what, what I'm checking with my body the most about at the moment is my right knee has started to ache for no reason. And I keep uh, thinking about it and going, is this the beginning of the end? Like, am I, <laughs> am I about to hit that age where suddenly it all goes? Is this your personal body getting? Yes. Yes. Where is you're this, just like, yeah. yeah, this is the last days now. Uh, yeah. I suspect not. I suspect not. <laughs> I think with pains, cause I've been doing a lot of exercise over the last 18 months of lockdown or however long it's been now, different parts of my body take the strain. So I used That's to have interesting. a really, really painful piriformis, which I mostly cured with yoga. Then with dance, I had to stretch my leg in a certain way to stop the pain um, mm-hmm. in my sacrum. And then the pain went to my upper knee, um, above my knee, the muscle above my knee. At the moment, I've got uh, an Achilles heel. I wake up in the morning and I, as I go down the steps, it's like, oh, oh, oh. But I think often the part of the body taking the strain is taking the strain off something else that's tight. Mm. And the pe- it's got to go somewhere if you're doing a lot of exercise. It's got to go somewhere. And if you're not doing a lot of exercise, it's got to go somewhere because whether you're moving it, whether you're not moving it, it hurts because you're moving it, it hurts because you're not moving it, whatever you do, there's going to be a certain amount of pain and that is just the case if you're not 11 years of age. Yes, yes. It does amaise me how things that used to be effortless are uh, effortful now. And just, yeah. you know, like I, I was always very adamant when I was younger that I could carry anything and I could lift heavy stuff and that I was always really like, no, no, I'm fine. I can move this chest of drawers on my own. And now I've gone, actually, you know what? I can't do that anymore as much as it annoys me. Could you carry that heavy box? Because I'm just going, yeah, I'm just not as strong as I used to be, which, you know, is also me not doing stuff to make myself that strong. But I have just, I'm just aware of, um, of aging and getting puffed and stuff. And I did mm. lots of running over our first lockdown last year and I have never run before, but really started to enjoy it in a weird way. It was a good time to listen to podcasts, I found. Mm-hmm. So I ran heaps and then I went back to New Zealand because my mum was ill. And then when I came back, I just lost all my fitness. And I felt like I um, I exercised to a level of fitness over the first lockdown and then I just exercised out of it. So I kind of like, <laughs> like I went backwards in fitness. And that's a really bizarre thing to get my head around as well, of going, well, I could do that six months ago. Do you know what, though? Uh, this is true of fitness. 
if you have got yourself that fit before, it's a much quicker journey back. Your body remembers. I gain and lose fitness so quickly. Like I can get a cold and then get my period and think, oh, and actually I'm not, I don't want to be huffing and puffing and running around. And in two weeks, I'm like, oh, well, I've lost all my fitness. I get back on the Peloton and I, I, the Peloton is numbers. It's like, you can do this, this resistance. So I can absolutely see my fitness change. And I'm like, oh, this is so frustrating. I've slipped back, but then quickly I can get back to where I was. Personal trainers have told me it's science. Even if 10 years ago you were running frequently, when you come back to it, your body remembers. It goes, oh, we've done this before. So every time you get fit is not a waste. Your body remembers it. I like that. I like that. And my body remembers it goes, oh, are we doing this again, are we? It's exactly what it does. Because I'm not someone who's ever maintained fitness in my life. The longest I've maintained a proper relationship with moving my body and exercising and cardio has been in the last couple of years because of the whole lockdown situation. Mm. It's the longest I've ever done. I am pretty fit at the moment, I notice. Uh, If I have to run upstairs at a train station or something, I'm like, oh, I can run up the stairs, carry my suitcase, jump on the train and not really be out of breath. And it's a real, it's great. good. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, even even thinking about that, I feel a little bit uh, puffed. Just you saying that sentence is making me go, oh, I probably have to stop halfway up just for a little rest. Oh, I need to sit down now, yeah, just even telling that story. Um, <laughs> but also I'm aware it's a privilege that I've been able to get fit in lockdown um, yeah. and it's a privilege that my body moves in the way I ask it to. I mean, not in really in the way I ask it to. I, I, I would ask a lot more of it, but I'm asking reasonable amounts of it. But do you know something my dance teacher can do that I'm so envious of? She squats down to get something or to take a video of me or something like that. And then she just stands up without putting her hands on the ground. So she wow. can, from a squat, just stand. She does lots of capoeira and lots of training. And that's what I want to do. I want to be able to just squat and stand and squat and stand. And I'm so jealous of how elegantly she does it. And it is my mission now. And I don't really know how to. I've said to her, I want to learn how to do that. I guess I might have to do it with my back against a wall for a while. Yeah, right. And build my core strength more, do more sit-ups. I don't know. What My immediate thought was you saying she's able to squat down and then stand up. I bet she doesn't go, Ugh! either. I bet she just stands up noiselessly. She is in her early 30s and makes no old lady noises at all when she wow. stands up. Yeah. And she's been a dancer since she was a small child. Like she can't even remember a time before dance and it's her wow. full-time career. So yeah, her body is a machine. But I want a little bit of that because a yoga teacher once told me that if you are lying down and can stand up without using your hands, just sort of, I guess, using the momentum of the rock to get up on your feet, that's a great indicator of longevity and fitness wow. into your old age. So your flexibility, your strength, you know, because we we can allow our bones to ossify. We can allow our strength to go, all of those things. At a certain age, it's use it or lose it. And again, I speak from a place of privilege. I do not have a disability. But if you do have the privilege of a body that you can strengthen, I sort of feel an obligation to myself and feminism to strengthen it <laughs> if I can. If I've got, the, again, the luxury of the time, I don't have any children, things like that. I, I'm... I'm aware there's plenty of people with children who are much fitter than me. I don't mean that, but I just mean if there's time available and bandwidth available, I should do it. I I had this revelation about myself uh, when I went to the Fringe Festival in Adelaide last year in a glorious time when there was no lockdown. Every time I see like a circus show or a burlesque show, I'm left at the end of it going, is it too late to get bendy? Because they look at, I look at people using their bodies in this fantastic way, and I go, oh, "I reckon could I fit myself in a box like that contortionist? Like it's the thing, it's the thing that I aspire to do that I've never got around to doing. Mm, flexibility. I've al- yeah, I've also realised that um, the biggest compliments, or the, the the compliments that I receive as being uh, the most valuable, are from bendy people. So, like if a circus performer that I've just watched fold themselves into a handbag and set themselves on fire and fly around the tent. You're like, someone who's done something extraordinary physical, physical, when they give me a compliment, I'm like, oh, my God, oh, a, a physical person that knows how to be physical. Like it's, it's just this weird thing I think I have because mm. it seems so far out of my reach to be, you know, to fly around on a hoop or 
mm. fall down some silks or, you know, that kind of thing. Not to say I don't love compliments from everybody, but I think it's because they do something that I cannot imagine doing when they like what I do, which is just standing and chatting. I It kind of goes in more. It's like, um, yeah, it's like being noticed by the circus or something. It's I such hear a childlike that. response. So Cal Wilson's new pegs is compliments from bendy people. So if you were listening to this and you are in the circus, uh, if you're somebody who can climb a silk silk rope or something like that, uh, yeah. if you wouldn't mind tweeting Cal Wilson at Cal Wilson, is it at Calbo, isn't it? What is no, it? It's at Calbo on Twitter, at Calbo Wilson on Instagram. That's not to yeah. say that I don't value compliments from everyone, but it is just... If you are going that- to compliment Cal... Could you just at least <laughs> pretend to be someone who can fit yourself into a suitcase just for her own psyche? It's, wow. it's, it's a very specific uh, fetish that she has. Uh, oh, don't don't she- kink shame me, Deborah. <laughs> uh, no, I do know what you mean because I think the same. I sort of think oh, what we do is chat or manipulating words for stand-up yes. and is it really a thing? But of course, if you can't do that, if you're good physically, but you're not somebody who's intuitively verbal or intuitively comedic, you think that's a genius skill. Like what, you know, the grass is always greener and anything that comes to you naturally, you tend not to rate as much. You go, ah. That's true. So I think what you do is brilliant and a skill and I would absolutely still admire it even if I could do the trapeze. I used to, when I was changing my son's nappy when he was uh, a baby, in the effortless way he would put his feet in his mouth. Like I would go, when do you lose that? When do you, when do you lose that ability? Like if only, if, if only, not that I have much call for putting my feet in my mouth unless it's metaphorically. Yeah. But Did you love a compliment from your son when he could put his feet in his mouth? Did, was yes. that, was, you'd it think, was, oh. Well, I couldn't really make it out because there was a lot of toes. And it was more mum like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> it was quite hard to understand. But, but you knew he was, he was thinking yeah. it. Cal. I'm going to ask you something else about checking up your body. How often do you check your breasts to see well, if there are any lumps? Uh, I do it quite a lot because um, I have a lot of breast cancer in my family. So my grandmother and my maternal aunt and my mum have all had breast cancer. And I have a thing called, uh, is it fibroedema? I, I'm not sure. that uh, it's. I have um, cysts in my breasts, so I go and get a mammogram every year or two years because they're they're, called, they're known as breast mice which is a weird term um really yeah so I think I think it's because they're small and they they're quite hard to feel and they move around they're quite hard to kind of locate and you can only get rid of them if you give them cheese I think that's why they're called breast mice um but so I I do a regular check because because of that history in my family and also yeah having found a lump before I I keep an eye on things and it's um it's so weird, like like uh, getting a mammogram isn't the most pleasant thing in the world. Like it's, I have described it as being, it's like you're running for a lift and not all of you made it in. Oh, wow. Like it's, it's sort of, and it's for people with larger breasts, I think it's not as painful because I, I, have, <laughs> um, I have quite small boobs. It's quite hard to get enough of them on the, in between the plates. Mm. Um, but it's really important, obviously, to do. And it's also, it's such a strange thing to do. Like, and if you have, um, I've had ultrasounds done as well, and it's kind of like someone, um, they've got a a detachable shower head and they're just kind of ironing your breasts to find out what's going on. It's such, it's, it's all quite odd, but it's so important. Hello, Guilty Feminists. It's Jessica Regan here, and I am delighted to be announcing our Big Speeches Winter Workshops. They are taking place on Saturday, November 27th, Sunday, November 28th, Saturday, December 11th, Sunday, December 12th, Saturday, January 15th, and Sunday, January 16th. All Saturday workshops are taking place from 10.30am to 2.30pm and all Sunday workshops are taking place from 3 to 7pm. So hopefully whatever part of the world you're in, there's a time slot there that suits you. We are keeping the workshops online as that makes them as accessible and inclusive as possible and we're all about that at The Guilty Feminist. So please go to guiltyfeminist.com forward slash big speeches to secure your place or indeed This could be a Christmas present for someone that you think might need a confidence boost. New year, new you, 
whatever your motivations, we will be delighted to see you there. Places do book out fast, so act now to avoid disappointment. And of course, as always, there are heavily subsidised places available. Well, that leads us to our first guest today. Our first guest today received a breast cancer diagnosis at the age of 32 and found it so brave to help young women of Australia to be educated, empowered and hashtag breast aware. Please welcome Rochelle Panitz. Rochelle, hello. 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 Hi, everyone. So, Rochelle, tell us about So Brave. Why is firstly, why is it called So Brave? Okay, well, it wasn't called So Brave. It was called the Young Women's Breast Cancer Fundraiser Project. Um, and we were talking to media and they would say, hang on a sec, what, what, what was that? Um, and so a friend of mine said, look, you really need to think of a decent, catchy name for this thing that you're doing. And so I couldn't think of one. We came up with a bunch of ideas, but nothing felt quite right. Um, so with most things with the project, I, I put it out there into the universe and I said, right, okay. I'll go to sleep now and you'll tell me what it's going to be. So I wake up at three o'clock in the morning and all I could hear was this word, brave, 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 brave. And I thought, if I don't put it in my phone, I'm going to forget it. So I put it in and I just did um, an acronistic sort of poem kind of thing with it. B, breast cancer, R, research, A, advocacy and awareness, V, voices, and E, empowerment. And so I shut my phone, went back to bed, woke up the next morning, madly looking at all the domains to see what's available. Uh, Of course, Brave already taken across everything. So I, um, yeah, I I was trying to spitball, okay, what do we call? Lots of people saying, oh, what about Be Brave? And I said, oh, it's a bit too passive. It doesn't really encompass everything that we're trying to talk about. And I remembered um, a lady from my community when I was going through my treatment and I used to wear wigs because I lost all my hair through chemotherapy. Um, And she was always very well dressed, always looked immaculate, uh, wouldn't go outside of the house without her hair perfectly set. And I was turning up without my wig because it's too hot and my hair looked well, like a chemo patient, bald and a bit wispy with hairs everywhere. And I remember her coming up to me and saying, you are so brave. And I, at the time I was like, no, I'm not brave. This is just me getting through it, trying to like live so I can be here for my family. Um, but yeah, I think that's so brave story. Every single cancer patient can relate to But also these women, they are really, really brave. You know, they've been through the trauma of a breast cancer diagnosis and then they front up to get body painted and then have photo shoots in like public areas so that we can put it in a calendar so they can share their story and and raise awareness. So it kind of started off as a bit of a like roundabout route to getting to where we were, but it it really makes a lot of sense for who we are and, and what we're trying to achieve with young women. Great. So it's partly what's imposed upon you of, oh, you're so brave, but it's partly the ownership of the bravery it takes, not just to experience it, but to advocate for it. How did you feel when you first got that diagnosis? What was that experience like? So to start with, my diagnosis wasn't simple. Breast cancer in the majority of women is found in your 50s or 60s. Uh, But for about 5% of women in Australia, they will be aged under 40 years old. In Australia, we also have a breast screening, um, which is free for anyone aged 50 to 74, and anyone from 40 can access it. Um, Anybody in the 20s and 30s is considered low risk. Uh, But something I found out after I started So Brave is actually that breast cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer in women aged 20 to 39. So this kind of misperception of of breast cancer being this older woman's disease needs to kind of have that cultural shift. And it was definitely my experience when I was going through my diagnosis. Um, I was pregnant with my second child in my third trimester and I was in bed this one night and I remembered seeing um, a breast check card hanging up in my, my wardrobe. And it just reminded me, oh, I haven't done that in a little while. I'm going to do that. And when I did, I noticed this 
pea-sized hard lump in my right breast on the right side of my right breast. And I turned to my husband, I said, can you feel this? It doesn't feel right. I, I don't remember feeling it before. And he said, look, you know, let's bring it up with our obstetrician um, at the next appointment because I was seeing her every couple of weeks by that point. And when I spoke to her, she wasn't very concerned. She said, yeah, I can feel it. I'll make a note in your um, record, but we won't do anything until after the baby's born. It's probably just fibrous tissue, your body getting ready for your baby. Um, so I didn't really think all that much about it following that. And then when my son was born, I remembered breastfeeding him and feeling this lump thinking that it actually, I felt had gotten bigger. So I went back to my obstetrician on the phone and this was before Christmas. So she's in sort of trying to, you know, minimize all of her consults because she's, you know, trying to shut down for Christmas and wouldn't answer the phone. It was actually her receptionist who told me that if I was really worried about this thing to go see my general practitioner. So GP is the first line of defense here in Australia. So when I saw my GP, my GP referred me to get an ultrasound. At that ultrasound, the sonographer tried looking for it, couldn't find it, um, sent me out to the waiting room. And then another person from their team came and told me in front of everybody in the waiting room that it was nothing, just normal lactating tissue, nothing to worry about. And I remember saying to her as I was sort of running towards her to try and keep her a bit quiet was, well, I'm worried about this. Like, when shall I come back? She said, oh, look, six months. And I said, but what if I feel like it's different? She said, well, come back earlier. And kind of really dismissed me a lot with like my concerns and how I was feeling. Anyway, so I went home to my mother and I said to her, she's a nurse. Um, most of my mum and her, her sisters are nurses. And I said, you know, where do you go get your mammograms these days? And, you know, so she sent me off to the place where she was getting her mammograms and ultrasounds. And it just so happened that that second opinion and going and getting that second ultrasound, which then became within the space of that one hour, an ultrasound, a single side mammogram and a punch biopsy um, that I was diagnosed um, because had I not sort of complained about it and followed it up and then pushed through, then I wouldn't have gotten my diagnosis because everybody kept saying, you have no family history you're young, you're breastfeeding, you don't fit any of our risk categories, we don't think this is breast cancer until it was. And then well, the so, chief so radiologist. It's a big, it's a big yeah. call for you to have to make to advocate for yourself like that because every step of the way you've been dismissed. Mm-hmm, 100%. And that's why after going through my own treatment, an intense treatment for me was two fairly invasive surgeries uh, six full-on months of very highly cytotoxic chemotherapy and then seven weeks of radiotherapy, 12 months of immunotherapy, and then I've been on hormone therapy since, gosh, the end of that year, so nearly seven years. The onus is on young women to know their bodies, to go to their GP and advocate that their GP is going to do something to follow up, then advocate to the sonographers and the radiologists so that they will follow up, and then also that they will do their own follow-up with the doctors. So if you've gotten a benign test, like you were saying, fibroadenoma, I would 100% tell you, you need to be on some kind of schedule to be checking your breasts on a much more regular basis now that you've already had something that's benign. Yeah, that's great. And that's what we wish for all young women. We wish for them to go in and be a hypochondriac and say, look, I found this thing. I'm not sure what it is. Get it checked out and it to be nothing rather than somebody who thinks, oh, I'm too young, I don't have a family history, um, I'm being told it's nothing, and then them end up getting a, a stage four terminal diagnosis. Because in Australia, we have excellent rates of survival for women who have been diagnosed in stage one, two, and three. But for women across the world who get a stage four diagnosis, um, where in, in terms of stages, just so people understand what that means, Breast cancer in stages one, two, and three hasn't really spread beyond the breast tissue and into the armpits. But if it's gone to stage four, it means it's metastasized. It's gone to somewhere else in your body. So your bones, your liver, your brain, um, somewhere else in your body. Um, and, and it's not um, curable um, when it gets to that stage. So what we're trying to do is make young women aware of breast cancer risk and also to empower them 
to speak up for their own health so that if there's something not right and so as as so brave has gone we've been working with young women across the country who are all diagnosed under 40 uh, we do these really empowering body painting exercises with them and then we create a national calendar each year uh, but as we've morphed and as we've grown become our own charity we've also then moved into that young women's education focus because young women need to know this they need to know these skills so that they're carrying them through their whole life. Because if they don't get diagnosed in their 20s or 30s, then the likelihood is that they might get diagnosed in their 40s, 50s, 60s or 70s or even into their 80s. And they need to be able to be breast aware throughout their life so that when they're finding something abnormal, they can advocate. And with young women too, it's about removing some of that stigma and the taboo around breasts. You know, um, for a lot of young women, they've only just started developing and, you um, It's all a bit unknown and, oh, my God, what is this thing and how does it work? And so trying to remove some of that taboo around even talking about breast health or body health in any way and trying to get them to realise that this is just a normal part of being a woman. You know, women across the world have boobs and we all need to know what they feel like so that we can advocate on our best behalf because, unfortunately, breast cancer is worldwide the most commonly diagnosed cancer in women. Mm -hmm. Um, And while it has excellent, you know, outcomes for for some, unfortunately it still still kills people. Um, So we Mm -hmm. need to be vigilant. All of this is absolutely amazing, Rochelle. I think it's so brilliant what you're doing. I'm quite shocked it took you so many times advocating for yourself. I think... I'd be someone who'd go, oh, thank goodness, they've just said it's nothing, it's fine. (laughs) And I'd go away. And so uh, it's really important that I've heard this, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners have heard this, to not just go, great news, bye. If you get that feeling, you have to keep pushing. I felt a lump once and I went in and it got tested and it was fine, but it was really good to know. A friend of mine went in to the GP and said, I found this lump in my breast. And the doctor went, uh, it was a male doctor, and so he said, oh, how did you find it? Like he was disgusted that she'd been touching her own breasts. And she said, oh, my boyfriend, she said, my boyfriend found it because she saw that his response was, oh, isn't that awful? Isn't that awful? This was some time ago, but it's, it's really awful. And so sometimes you really do, and I know there's millions of absolutely brilliant GPs out there working incredibly hard, but sometimes you do have to push past those attitudes, or as you say, busy people, you know, who are seeing lots of people, NHS overstretched, uh, you know, public health service in Australia overstretched, you have to speak up for yourself. It does make me wonder if English is not your first language and you're in an English language country, if you're someone who's from a marginalised group who's always told to go away, the whole thing about women not being believed uh, in their symptoms, which we know is a phenomenon, you really do. And if you know anyone in your life or you advocate for anyone in your life to be pushy and to say, I need it to be seen again. I need a second opinion. I need a third opinion. If you get that sense, as you say, better to be told, yes, we've done an absolute check. Now we've seen the mammogram. It's absolutely nothing. And to go away reassured than to live with that worry because anxiety in itself can affect your health. And with breast cancer, this is uh, for women, non-binary people with breasts, trans men, um, but also cis men can get breast cancer too. And so, you know, listen to your body, whoever you are. Yeah, 100%. And I guess when we go into schools, we talk about body health as well as breast health because it could be something else. It could be that they've got some kind of gynecological issue. You know, in Australia as well, we have a, a huge amount of women who get endometriosis that gets left undiagnosed and untreated for years because people think that it's just a painful period and they they just they don't ever get diagnosed properly so I think what we're trying to really see in and the next sort of generation is a group of people who are pushing for health for themselves and for the best health that they can possibly have and some of that is taking ownership of the fact that as you said we've got humans who are the doctors and humans make mistakes. So if they're busy and they maybe don't do a full history of you, then you need to know all of those things so you can say, well, look, I know my body, this isn't right, I want it investigated. Um, And if they don't believe you or don't agree with you, go see somebody else, like you said, get that second, third or however many opinions you need to get. 
Yeah, absolutely. Right. Check in with your body and then check in with your medical professionals and don't take no for an answer if you're feeling that something's wrong. Just do make sure you get that second opinion. What's the response been like? Like you're talking about working in schools. Like what have you, yeah. how have people responded to it? Yeah. Uh, so when we go out to schools, we ask them to do a bit of a feedback form. Um, at one of our most recent schools, 84% of the girls there, and they were a 15 or 16 year old, all, all the girls in that year group, they all said that they felt more confident about their breasts and breast health following our seminar. So I think it's probably something that needs to be incorporated as part of health studies anyway, but, you know, schools themselves are quite busy, so it doesn't always make, you know, the cut. But I think if young women hear the message and, and we push it out through our social media, we try and go out to as many schools and universities as, as we can. We've got partnerships with universities and schools. Uh, but if we can try and get that message canvassed out amongst the young women, then this won't be something that's a shock. When we say something like young women get breast cancer too, they'll be like, of course young women get breast cancer too because you're a woman. It can it affects anybody. Um, and as you were saying before, you know, men do get breast cancer, not in the same numbers and the same rates, but, you know, men need to be aware of their own body and their own health as well and, and to go and, and get those diagnoses and those tests as soon as possible. In terms of how our imagery and our beautiful artwork and our videos is received, people are always like completely overwhelmed by these women that have like not only gone through, you know, the complete trauma of losing breasts and their hair and putting on weight and losing weight and, you know, losing fertility and all those sorts of things, but then they front it up to do something that is so very unique. Um, body painting isn't something that everybody has even ever seen, let alone uh, experienced personally. So for us to be able to create this kind of movement where we've got a whole bunch of women from across the country who've been able to participate in this, even when we, we see other young women who are just at the beginning of their diagnosis, they see this and it gives them hope. There was one lady in particular who on her very first day of chemotherapy was given um, one of our previous calendars by her breast care nurse and she said the, the day was completely grey and then I was given colour because all of these women showed me that they got through so I felt that I could get through too. And, I mean, that kind of motivates us to keep going because we know that there will be another generation of girls next, like people getting diagnosed with this every single day of the year. And so we need to be able to think about those women who are at the very beginning of their journeys, um, who are looking to find support and looking to find the other people. And, yeah, I think that connection as well. A lot of young women don't know another young woman who's got breast cancer. It's very isolating being in a chemo ward where you're probably the youngest by 20 or 30 years or you go to a support group and and the same sort of thing. You're, you're talking with grandmothers um, and women who've, families have already grown up and you're talking about your your daycare problems or your you know your little children problems and you know all of the other things that you've got to deal with that perhaps a very different life experience and life stage uh, so having that connection with other women who are able to sort of talk about oh the loss of fertility for example or relationships and sexuality and some of those other things that probably you know we don't really consider when we're thinking about breast cancer, but it's the broader impact that it has on these women's lives. Um, so having that connection is really important. So where can we find you? Where can we find So Brave? Okay, so uh, our website, sobrave.org.au, and uh, we're on uh, Instagram and Facebook at So Brave Official. Um, and, yeah, contact us, reach out. We always like a like and a share. And at the moment, we've just launched our 2022 calendar. So, um, yeah, if you haven't bought your calendar for this year or if you know some people in your life that might benefit from some breast awareness and breast tips and some inspiration from these young women, then please do go and buy lots and lots of copies. Great. Check it out, both your breasts and all of the So Brave profiles. Thank you so much, Rochelle. Woo oh, gosh. Thanks, guys. That was amazing. Thank you.
So our second guest today is a model and body love activist who's finally decided to take the advice of people who said you could be a model if you lost weight, but only take half that advice, you could be a model, and is just doing it anyway, recently becoming the star of Australia's first bikini billboard with a fat model. Please welcome April Helene Horton. Woo! (laughs) Hello. So April, you were Australia's first bikini billboard model who is fat. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, absolutely. It was um, it was something that came about after I did uh, a little Insta video of me wearing a swimsuit from a brand called Curvy Swim. Marsha from Curvy Swim reached out to me and said, we want to do this campaign and we'd love to have you. You seem really confident, which we know can sometimes be code for. Surprisingly, you don't seem to hate yourself because you're fat, um, which I don't. Hooray. And so Marsha wanted to to know if I want to be part of this campaign. And so Jez Smith, who you might know as uh, one of the judges from Australia's Next Top Model, he's also a photographer who's worked with lots of high-profile people, and he's really, you know, he's spoken out quite a lot about how misogyny and beauty standards are harming women uh, in the industry. And so he came on board with the project and so took my photo. I was wearing a lilac velvet bikini that was very small velvet so small the smallest bikini that ever was and I was on Cronulla Beach uh for Australian listeners they'll be like wow that is intense and yes it was it was the first day that the beach was open after uh a Christmas time lockdown too so people were swarming the joint there was people with I don't know canoes or whatever it is kayaks I don't know you know surf life-saving practice and I don't know, nippers, the whole bit. And I was there in my tiny bikini and this huge setup, cameras, lights, film crew, because we were also filming for a TV show. And yeah, it was the time, but it was, ama- it was amazing. And the billboard, when I actually saw it for the first time in my entire life, I was actually speechless. So. Wow. Wow. Did you find yourself driving around and around past the billboard again and again? Because that's what I would I- do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I could. It, the bell, the billboard was in Melbourne and I live in New South Wales. So I got to see it for the big reveal. And then I was lucky to get lots of photographs from friends, most of whom were like, I just pulled over to take this photo. Uh, so there was quite a lot of, I was getting a lot of those messages that were like, look what I just saw. So it was definitely out there. It was being seen. So that was cool. It was across Australia. So it was really cool. Um, this is a real, I'm a feminist, but, but I'm a feminist, but I'm concerned about how practical a velvet bikini is. Yes, I'm also on board with that. Could we just discuss um, the velvet element? You know when someone gives you an ornamental hand towel and when you wet it, it the water just runs straight off? It's mm. kind of like that. So not absorbent as such um, on the outside, but then the inside's wet, so the, the outside's dry, the inside's wet. So when I was, because obviously I only wore it for the photo shoot, it's not really my usual type of getup, and I agree, it, it's not the best for swimming. I imagined it would soon be zero bikini. I'd need to go to a nudist beach just to be safe. And, yeah, <laughs> when the bottom half of it was wet, it was like it was. It looked soggy. I mean, it felt soggy, <laughs> but it looked fine. So... Everyone was like, hey, yeah, you look great. I was like, ha, ah, yes, I am very moist and not in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it sounds like a modelling bikini more than a, a, a swimming bikini. It's not something you'd wear to the public pool to do laps in. Um, no. But that's definitely not the point of this. It was just something that I was, was, was in my mind and I thought might be in the mind of the listeners, so I thought I'd address it straight up. Um, I know that when I was being raised in Australia in a beach town, how much the forces of thinness were at work. And I was never thin. I always felt I had to hide a bit at the beach because there was one sort of body that was celebrated and it was the thinnest possible body. How much do you think Australia has changed with the body positive movement and the fat liberation movement? Do you feel there is a different sort of acceptance? Because I think the the body that's broadly celebrated around the world now, like big butts of come in like there's no question about that like around the world big parts have come in do you think Australia has moved with that or do you think it's still in this place of the smallest possible body on the beach is the most celebrated body I think definitely some parts of Australia have moved forward but like with racism we're super behind in lots of other places so I think in your more metropolitan areas where there's a higher propensity of diversity there are going to be lots of pockets of places where 
people are like, wear what you want, do what you want, be what you want, etc. There are also going to be those little niches of places where people are like, you can only do what's familiar to me, otherwise you can get out of here. And I live. I grew up in a regional town, the in fact first inland city, so nowhere near a beach. Um, so this wasn't necessarily so much of a problem for me growing up. But as a you know, when it, I remember having to do swim lessons for PE um, and putting on a, a swimsuit, and I know what you mean. And I, I was a fat kid. Like I, I wasn't a. I feel big compared to very slim children. I was a fat kid, and I felt horribly self conscious. And it was, and for good reason because everybody in my class was like. It was that literal like a record scratch, walk out, dead silence, everybody turns their head to look at you. All I was doing was walking along but because you're a spectacle, that's that's just how it is. So I think in terms of do I think my child will go to school and that behaviour will continue, yes, I do, but in a much lower degree and, and probably get called out more often like, hey, man, you can't talk like that. I, I definitely think back in the day, no, but nobody was stopping anyone from being mean to fat kids. And I think that has changed. Will they stop being mean? No. But will people be like, oi, cut it out? Yes. I think that's the difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you think campaigns like this make a difference? Do you think the fact that there is a beautiful, fat woman of colour Sometimes I've been told I'm not supposed to say woman of color for an individual woman. I meant to say black woman or black, like women of color. Sure. Because you're saying, oh, this is an issue for women of color, but one woman is like an indigenous woman or a black woman or a well, brown I'm woman. I'm a or brown woman, but okay. I am totally okay with being called a woman of color. I like acronyms. So, you know, I'm all of it. I walk. I don't necessarily call myself a walk because that could confuse me with a piece of kitchenware, but I definitely <laughs> would say I was a woman of color, but also a brown woman. I am feeling very brown today with this very cute bronzer look that I've got on. So, yes, I am, I think in terms of, uh, yeah, that diversity piece, I think seeing a, a fat woman of color, so someone who's different from people in lots of different ways, that intersectional kind of thing of, even if you're thin but you're brown or you're fat but you're white, you're still seeing yourself reflected somewhere in that. Do I think these campaigns are making a difference? Yes, I definitely do. I get feedback from people that say, I went out and bought a bikini today because I saw that you did that. So from my point of view, I'm getting that. And I, for all of the negative comments or and there weren't that many or messages or things that I got, I got 25 good ones. So I, I definitely think the impact that it's having far outweighs and that's probably a little bit about the fact that I don't really, I don't go looking for, I don't read the comments. Do you know what I mean? If I know I'm, yep. I'm not going to go to the Today Show and read mm -hmm. the comments because we know what I'm going to find there. Men named Warren being like, oh, this can't be healthy. <laughs> Nobody asked you, Warren, shut up. Um, <laughs> but and that's a, that's actually a real life story. But I, when I was recording, it sounded I very think, specific. <laughs> <laughs> oddly, oddly specific. I um I also recorded um for SBS Australia. I recorded um as part of an episode that they actually asked the question, "What does Australia really think about obesity?" And they aired that about a month ago. And the feedback again that I got from that was overwhelmingly positive. But if I, when we were filming, they were like, can we get you to just go and read some Facebook comments? Like, just because that's, that's what you do when you're filming a TV show. You want to get the, you know, the, the good side and the bad side. And they were, I think, surprised that I was just like, oh, shut up. Like every comment I read, they, I think they were waiting for me to be upset. And I was just oh, like, right. oh, I don't care what old blokes think. I didn't I was, care yesterday. I don't care today because I can read it on Facebook. So they got you to read mean tweets about it, this. Essentially. Yeah. Wow, but Jimmy Kimmel that's... wasn't there. So yeah, that that's that seems the thing is with mean tweets. The reason that works is it's very glamorous, celebrated celebrities who are only hear good things about themselves and have yeah. won Oscars. Going, oh, you know, Brad Pitt should just shut up. I don't find him sexy, or what you know, whatever. But and he's Brad Pitt's usually like, oh well. I I know that a million people disagree, so I feel fine about it. Exactly. So that's the joke of that is seeing someone who's only ever praised and has beauty and glamour projected upon them by society read something from one individual who dissents. I don't know that it's okay to say to somebody who has lived a life of being in a marginalised group that gets a lot of uh, hate and gets a lot of heckling and abuse on a daily basis, read out that abuse. 
or those really nasty opinions. I'm sorry they made you do that. And I am uh, really amazed that you were able to do it in a way that felt very Teflon, where you were like, nah, I'm going to shrug it off. Well, I, I did say when we were filming, they you know, because of course it's very like, and how does that make you feel? And I said, well, old mate could have written, you're a turtle. And I'd be like, no, I'm not. So if he writes, <laughs> you're less valuable to society than me because you're fat, I'm like, no, I'm not. So I just am like, they're not facts, Warren. You don't, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, Bloody so- Warren, better not cross me. If I see him on the street, I'll give him a smack in the mouth. Uh, so Warren, if you're listening, and I know that you're not, uh, you take it all on board, take it all on board. But that's, it's, it's really interesting. You seem to have really internalized. I don't think I've internalized enough of this. Like rationally, um, I get it, but I don't think I've internalized enough of it that I could sit on Facebook. I, sometimes the things people say, and I, I don't, I'm very lucky. I don't get a lot of, uh, hate stuff on Twitter. And if I do, it tends to be from, uh, you know, somebody Men. just saying feminism is cancer <laughs> or something like that, or you know, like oh. it's it's something that's not really about me. Sometimes it's so risible, it's so extreme that I find it funny because yeah. so it's 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 really extreme. Like somebody once said, underneath what I think of as a is an extremely sexy picture of me. I can't read this article. I'm too distracted by her ugly face and her ugly body. <laughs> and I was like. Wow. If you think this is an ugly face and ugly body, you should see me in real life because this is one of the best pictures of me ever taken. And I look smoking. So I found it because I just thought that's just a person putting out, you know, fury into the world. It's nothing to do with me. Um, yeah, it's, not a, it's not a happy person that loves everything no. except your ugly face and your ugly no. whatever. But if somebody said to you, oh, is that what you're wearing? You'd be like, um... <laughs> Sorry, something wrong with this? Like if someone wants to go exactly. out vitriol, you're like, shut up. But if they were if they just simply went, Oh, hair, different, looks looks different, you're like, but does it look nice? Suddenly you're in a spiral. Um, yeah, yeah. And I feel like, yeah, I get you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um I I stopped reading comments about myself years ago, just after I'd had my son, because I stumbled across in my little vanity search, I stumbled across hmm. a conversation between a bunch of men discussing how they hoped I kept breastfeeding because it made my tits look amazing <gasps> while I that was on a is panel show. Foul. Isn't it? It just oh made me go, God. oh, that's, that's enough of the comments forever. Unsubscribing from the yep. internet. Yep. <laughs> wow. Wow. Oh, that's foul. Wow. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you do have to wonder what's going on with men when they say things like that. Like, do they not understand that even if they did think that, they could keep that to themselves? Um, yeah, that's like... And other people to, can read yeah. it? Yeah, they could not They could not put that on the internet. They could realise how awful that thought was and not put that on the internet for the woman in question to read, knowing yeah, I mean, the I, risk. I mean, maybe they wanted me to read it. Maybe, I mean, the worst part would be if I looked down and it was my husband's name on the comment. It wasn't, though, because he's a lovely human. But He might have a dummy account, though. <laughs> Hasn't everyone got a burner these days? <laughs> <laughs> it, was that your husband's Instagram? I follow him on that. <laughs> um, he has said to me a couple of times, just by the DMs, would you encourage Cal to have another baby? I'm not really interested in more children, but I am interested in those breasts coming back. Um, I mean, that. the irony of the whole thing is that they were very unevenly sized. I had. Uh, I was calling it the Uber boob because it was quite large and it was quite small. And whenever I did a TV appearance, I would have to stick shoulder pads down one side so that I looked evenly balanced. Uh, oh. So I feel that the magic would have been would have been stolen from those guys if they'd known that. You'd be surprised. There'll be some people who are super into that. And now you've said that, those men will go back and watch. <laughs> they probably listen to, they're Uber fans of yours and they listen to absolutely everything you do. So they're listening to this now and they're like, ah, she read my comment. Ah, one boob bigger than the other. Excellent. And they're going back to find that that very thing. They're um, the same people who are turn. sending you peg recommendations. I'm, I'm going to assume that they're also now sharing. Imagine some awful old misogynist but who really agrees about pegs. Like It's just yes. like, look, I can't stand what she stands for, but she's a good peg. You can't go past one. I think they're thinking of them as nipple clamps. They're sending well, that's them to That's not what you. I was thinking of when I tagged you and Julia Gillard in those comments. <laughs> so I just really say, wanted you to see the ad mm-hmm. about the pants. So you say, April, can you prove it? No, I don't think you can. <laughs> I don't no think receipts. you can. 
<laughs> what was your personal journey? If you were a kid coming out, you know, and people were staring at you and teasing you and um, making your life difficult as a kid, and how did you get to the place where you could stand on a crowded beach with a small velvet bikini under lights and feel really glorious about yourself, love seeing yourself on a billboard, just find the Warrens of the world as risible? How did you get there? Uh, when I, after I had my son, I definitely went through kind of a period of looking at what I was contributing and what, what was I actually doing with my life? You know, from, you know, that real existential crisis that you get in the middle of the night while you're breastfeeding. Um, but you know, prior to that, I had been in, you know, some really terrible situations. I had, um, a a former friend who was really now when I reflect quite negative and, and sort of fat phobic, um, a former relationship where that person said to me after we got engaged, ew, um, we can't get married until you weigh certain number. (gasps) What? Why? What? Yeah. Go, just mean, back, 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 back. You were yeah. engaged to someone who said we can't get married until your weight is at a certain number. And then the next day I dumped him. So, like, it's a good story, really. Well, um, yeah, you, you lost weight, but it was just all him. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, that, I mean, and I was, I, I subscribed. The internalised fat phobia that I had up until the point that I didn't anymore, the things like I, I have said, and I'm, I'm sure that I said that in the context of, of the billboard and the bikini shoot was nobody can say anything to me that's meaner than something I've said to myself, mm. which is a sad truth that I think most people relate to. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I, I have had, so I had surgery as part of then the sort of progress after leaving that hideous relationship. I had surgery, I lost weight, um, not something I either recommend for or against. It's just something that happened. It's part of the story. Wouldn't be here today talking to you two glorious humans if I hadn't done that. So that's fine. But what I realised after doing that, I really noticed the way that people treated me differently when I was significantly smaller. Mm. I was like, that is so gross. I I liked it. I'm a feminist, but I liked it. But it's still gross. And I realised this more and more as I reflected and as I said, a lot of that happened after I had my son and I thought, is, is my son going to be one of those people that acts differently towards fat people? No, like, no, nah, we're not about that. And then I started following people on Instagram who, you know, um, I can't even think of the first person I saw who I went, oh, my God, like I relate to that or I feel something about that. But it was just the slowly clawing my way out of that hole of thinking you're this or you're that because of your body because other people were sharing, you know, what they were doing. And I think because I am someone who's naturally optimistic, like I'm, a, you know, a happy person, I was just the funny fat friend and now I'm the funny fat friend who's like, yeah, like whatever, being fat, I don't care. So, you know, it's something that I just it just sort of happened but then when I started to notice it then I became more vocal about it and that's how I kind of came to be really talking about it a lot online and being really focused on it and wanting to be a part of the movement that's going to change the way that people talk about themselves and then of course each other. Do you think that it's still a battle because society keeps projecting stuff at you or do you think that people have changed the way they perceive you now because you've changed the way you've perceived yourself in your head and you refuse to be under those same power structures. I think it's definitely the latter for the most part, but I also see that when other campaigns and other things happen where I say, oh, I see myself there or they can do it, I can do it, you know, there is that element of you can't be what you can't see. So the more that we bring diverse bodies into the mainstream, everybody gets that chance to be like, well, why can't I do that? But Mm. I certainly think it's the latter in terms of I'm just, it's almost as if when people are like, oh, this is, you know, um, I'm, I'm this or that because I I'm fat or however they refer themselves. I'm plus size, I'm curvy or whatever. Um, and they feel a certain way about their value and their contribution and, and whether they're morally a good person. I just listen to that as if to be like, Oh, you obviously haven't had those those lessons yet. Like, you know, the same way that you're a year 11 student and you listen to year 7s talking about science or maths and you're like, oh, you'll learn. You just don't know yet. So I think it's just a growth of being determined to focus and um, choose to only take in things that 
add to what I already believe. There's a, I, I suppose it's a lot about curating what I'm seeing online, not spending time feeling bad about myself because I'm looking at all the different bodies that are out there that might make me feel less than. That's definitely part of it. And yeah, I think it's just part of my personality to be kind of like, oh, I don't know, like you guys are making out like I'm not cool, but I'm not sure I agree. It's such a powerful thing, I think, because I was thinking about this today, knowing that we were going to be chatting. It's such a powerful thing to love yourself and be open about that. And like you were saying before about, you know, the um, no one can say anything to you that is as bad as the stuff you've said to yourself. Like I totally relate to that in terms of like, you know, I'm I'm 51 and my body has changed from what it was and I've really struggled with that because I'm just not who I've always thought thought I was like my so when I cut my hair I used to have really long hair and I cut it and for three years I was a long haired person with short hair before I just went oh I have short hair like Mm -hmm. I still feel like I'm still part of me is telling myself I should be the same size I was when I was 30 and and I'm just not and it's still weird for me to go oh like I'm just I'm different and that's okay like it's still part of me going oh you don't look the way you did like it's so fascinating Mm -hmm. to me that at 51, I'm still doing that to myself, that I'm still having to to fight with myself to feel good about the way I look when, you know, I'm a feminist, but you'd think I would have sorted it out by now. Well, you're not the same in your head as you were when you were 30. That's the thing. It would be weird if you looked identical because you think of the growth that you've had mentally and emotionally and spiritually. I use spiritually to mean, you know, connection to the universe, whatever it is, you're not the same in those ways. So it would be weird if you looked exactly the same as you did when you were much younger and much less wise, maybe much less sure of yourself. I do sometimes, I'm a feminist, but I do sometimes get annoyed that confidence arrives just as collagen is leaving the building. I'm like, motherfucker, <laughs> I have just found myself. What the fuck is this now? I, I'm i like, could, is there any chance that confidence could have turned up while collagen was still around? It's like, it's like they tag team each other. It's like, you got this now. You got the confidence. You don't need the collagen. The collagen was there because you didn't have the confidence. I'm like, you motherfucker. Not a feminist term, but <laughs> seriously, you little tag team motherfuckers. I'm not okay with it. And I I get it when my mum has said to me that sometimes she'll see herself in a shop window or something and think, oh, who's that old lady? And she'll go, oh, it's me. But that's not what I look like. Because for most of your life, you don't look elderly. Most of your life, your face pretty much looks like your face, some version of it. And if I look at pictures of me now when I was 20, it's sort of, it's, you know, I still look like me. I will be going, oh, what's that line there? Or that's not as high as it was or whatever. But most people would just say, yeah, that's still Deb. And then at some point you start to look elderly and your face does look very different. You, you know, I always try and imagine what elderly people looked like when they were 20 because uh, I was trying to see the 20-year-old inside of them because I know that they still feel 20 or 25 or 30 or you know, people have an age that they still feel so I do understand that desire to just look like yourself and go, no, it's not, I don't recognize that person. I think there is something about identity and cutting your hair and going, I'm not myself anymore. I do absolutely get that. But I think the way I'm trying to see it is I'm not the same on the inside. Mm. I'm much healthier on the inside, I hope. So it's okay to look different on the outside. April, you're wearing a jumper yeah. that says the Bodzilla. Please explain. Oh, that's me. That's what I call myself on Instagram. Um, When I first started talking about body positivity and the experiences around being a fat person on Instagram, someone I knew said to me, I really love all that stuff that you're sharing. You should do that. You should, you know, and of course, the end of 2019 is when we were all deciding that we were going to have the best year ever in 2020 and we were going to grab hold of those passion projects and really make a new thing. And yeah, I don't know what we were thinking. But anyway, um, I changed my Instagram name to the Bodzilla. So that's me usually um in in places where you look for me online and it's kind of cool because I it, it does there's a sort of power behind it it's it's a very um sort of the onomatopoeia behind a word like Godzilla like it, it makes you feel like Ugh, like Ugh, which you know probably sounds much weirder when you can't see me you can only hear what I'm saying it's much better experience for you Cal because you can see me um during this recording but I um I, yeah, have made that my moniker. I've adopted that 
as my thing. Part of that is, I suppose, also too, that in my real life, although I am this body positive, you know, fat liberation, body acceptance, self-love, all of that um, person, I am still just a person. I guess the Bodzilla is my very, very um, obvious, I'm a feminist, but um, in my real life, you know what I mean? So I still am a person and I still wake up some days and I'm like, Jesus, is this what I'm working with? Is this honestly the face that I've got today? Even though yesterday this face looked amazing, um, today or, or you know tomorrow I might be like, oh, this is not, mm, it's not my best. Um, but that's that's where I, you know I get to the I've gotten to the point where I go, oh well, my face is not the most important part of this situation. Like you know I'm not going to my work um, for people to look at my face and make assessments of whether my face is good or not. And also you look totally different to other people than you do to yourself. So. The, you know, which true. is proven anytime someone takes your photo and you're like, geez, is that what I look like? Whoa, okay. Oh, um, it's the worst thing when you go, oh my God, that's an awful photo of me. And they go, no, it's a lovely photo of you. And then you're like, excuse me, if that's a lovely photo of me, is are you saying that's how you see me and that's the best I can look? If somebody says that's a horrible photo of me, you must agree. That is the only thing to do as a friend and a feminist. You go, yeah, that's not what you look like. That's a horrible photo of you. Even if you think it isn't, you must lie. It's very, very important. Never tell somebody that a photo they think is horrible is lovely. Never. It's cruel and it's wrong and I won't have it. My 12-year-old son has a, um, took a photo of me while I was asleep on the couch. I dozed off one afternoon, very unflattering photograph of me having a nap and used it as my um, my profile picture on his phone and just loved it and thought it was the <gasps> best thing ever. But we have we have discussed it. It is no longer the profile photo. Just just a terrible, <laughs> a terrible, snorry, very low angle, That's unflattering. That's not on, <laughs> not on, no. I go, aww. Like, because I feel like when my kid's 12 years old, he's not going to like me. So I, you know what I mean? He's going to be like, oh, shut up, mum. So I get excited about the idea that your kid might look at you and go, oh, look at mum. She's so peaceful. She's not talking. She's not nagging me to clean my room. I'm going to take probably what he loves about and, it. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and I think, Deborah, you said, you know, if I said that's a horrible photo of me, then you have to agree. I would be that person that would be like, no, it's not. I love how you look because I, I'm here and I can feel the feelings that I get when I look at that photo. But if you don't like how you look, then that's okay. We'll take another one. Um, but also I'm the person that gets in the photo and they go, oh, do you want to like, you, you remember when we used to do that thing where you'd turn your screen around and be like, do you want to check it? Like, like check mm -hmm. that you're okay with this photo. I was like, I don't know, mate. It's what I look like. Like post it. Like, I, am I, I naked? Is my tit out? No, <laughs> I'm good. Oh, I thought you were going to say, if not, let's go again. Let's, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> April, I think we've established that you're a better feminist than me. Your loveliness of going, well, I love the energy of this, but if you don't like, you know, and I love you and I love the way you look in all photos, but if you don't like it, let's take it again. That is a much better response than my response, which was, how dare you? You are, <laughs> you must agree with me. That's a much better response. And also, sure, you don't need to take it. I don't need to approve that photo. It's how I look. What a wonderful attitude, which I will never have. Um, I, <laughs> you're, you're just better than me. But also, I don't know that I would have the wherewithal to do a bikini billboard either. And I, I love that you do because actually, here's the interesting thing. I know that your bikini billboard, actually, I'm just going to look at it right now. Let me just have a look at it because I can find it online. This is dangerously close to the weird situation that sometimes happens in a taxi uh, where someone looks you up in front of you. Like, Oh, the worst. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. has that really had, happened? Had, I had that at the airport once, a guy that was booked to take me somewhere to a corporate gig. And once oh, I'd God. gotten his car, he was like, I've just been watching you online. And I was like, that, that's, not, that's not comfortable. No. Just, oh, wow. Yeah. And then also that, to that's... not say anything else about it, like not to be you were funny or I just I... like. Now Did we you both, follow it we up? Just, with yeah. yeah. Is there wow. an element of a compliment in this? It's really giving um, serial killer in the suburbs taxi driver vibes. Oh, God. <laughs> um, so I've looked up your picture and it is absolutely stunning. And your body, your energy, your face, it's just all completely glorious. So I know that when I look at you, that I see somebody who's completely beautiful and a completely home with their body. And so it's a place I would like to get to. Um, I'm certainly a lot further down the line than I used to be. I'm certainly a lot closer than I used to be, but I'd love to get to a point where I could do a bikini shoot and love what I see. 
I think your journey is one that I would like to take because I think it's so clear to me how glorious that photo is. Well, when the borders are open, you, me, Cal, whoever else wants to join us, beach, bikini, let's just do it. And then it's done. It could be a challenge, couldn't it? We could do a Guilty Feminist challenge. 12 metres of purple velvet. Yes. And then we're going to have a match. We we totally will. We have a craft afternoon where we make the bikinis and then we go to the beach. Oh my God. Yes. And then we (laughs) need like Cupid doll head headwear like I yes I'm 100% into this like you're yeah. laughing but later I'm going to be like so DMing you so like yeah, totally. okay all right up. can I can I <laughs> yes to all of this but can I bring my own bikini because I think one stitched together by me when I'm the worst sewer in the world in purple velvet is is not going to do for my confidence what you think it is uh, I think a glue gun rather than a sewing it's machine I'm going to literally be it's literally going to fall apart while I'm wearing it on the beach. I just think this sounds like the most horrendous afternoon of my life. If I can bring my own bikini, I am up for a bikini shot on the beach. I'll allow and it. I'll I will allow put it, it and I will put it up on the Guilty Feminist site and socials. Okay, all right. When we come to Australia next July, we're going to do a bikini shot. It's going to be oh, winter. It's going to be winter, <laughs> but we're going to do it anyway. We're going to do the winter blue bikini shot uh, yeah. where we're all shivering on the beach and we're going to invite other Guilty Feminists to come. We should get into Lake Burley Griffin because it'll be, you know, there'll be a Canberra show. Yep. Lake Burley Griffin, get your bikinis. With that beautiful, that beautiful fountain that looks like a fire hydrant the jet. has been uh, the damaged. Jet. Yep. Yes. Oh, was it going to be like the I- Friends opening with a fountain? <laughs> oh, no, Just it's not us. a fountain. It's it's not as good as a fountain. <laughs> when it hasn't been your day, your week, your Lake month. Burley Griffin. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. All right. And to putting out the light. Okay, I'm up for the bikini shot and we'll make a time. Also, I'm just extrapolating this out. What about we have one show and I'm just saying we as if I'm definitely going to be the co-host for that show. We have one show where you can only come if you're in a bikini. Um, uh, that's all we've got time for, sadly, now. Thank <laughs> you, Cal. So uh, yeah. underwhelmed. <laughs> I feel like some of our audience may say they find that exclusionary. And I would like to sell tickets. So, <laughs> but well, what, what, you could be a show where there's an option to come in a bikini, clothes yes. optional. I feel like here's the problem with announcing that mm-hmm. we are going to sell so many tickets to straight men who are not feminists. Called Warren. Called Warren, who are Bloody, coming yeah, for the bikini show. All the Warrens are going to buy tickets. They're not, they're not going to be into the feminism. They're not going to be listeners to the guilty feminists. They're just going to hear about this show where women are turning up in bikinis. And they're going to buy out half the venue. Ironically, they'll buy out the whole venue and there'll be no room for women in bikinis. It'll just be men called Warren in, in uh, hoodies and, and Max. Oh, and footy shorts. Now it'll be winter. They'll be wearing they'll be wearing normal clothes. They'll be wearing tracky dacks, Canterbury tracky dacks. Nice. <laughs> nice. Well, Oddly good work shopping, everyone. Once again. <laughs> All right. We'll, we'll listen. We, this I don't think this brainstorm turn. is complete. Um, listeners, it's, it's if spin, you're listening. It's a spin-off show. Yeah. It's start the group chat, Cal. Over to you. How about okay. th- how about we do one episode of the Guilty Warren, where only men <laughs> called Warren can come, but only if they're in a bikini. This is a Great. this is a, a smaller venue is needed, I think. Uh, a six seater <laughs> of of men just, in Australia just, called just Warren car. willing just to come Warren's out. Just Warren's house. Warren it, can just stay home. It's just well, all Warren should stay home, and if they want, wear a bikini. Um, done. Let's do that tonight. Warrens, stay home. Um, you're in lockdown. You have to stay at home. Orders for Warrens only. Oh, that would be really funny if they let oh, they let up the lockdown. Oh, nice but Warrens. If they let up the lockdown, yes, but I know I, I know a nice Warren. I feel bad. So for do him, I. I'm like I can't help that the person that left the crappy comment was Warren, and I immediately latched onto that in my mind. It's not my fault. Not all Warrens, as they hashtag say. hashtag yes. not all Warrens. Get that get that trending. Do you have anything to plug, April? Uh, well, yes, I do. I've recently released my own podcast. That's exciting. And because <gasps> I'm called The Bodzilla, it's called The Bodcast. So season two, uh, uh, amazing. I'm very excited. Part of the ACAST Creator Network, not unlike some of my other favourite podcasts. <laughs> yes, we're yeah, newly we, ACAST, yeah. We, um, so the, bod, yes. the Bodcast, B-O-D cast, and you can follow April at The Bodzilla. Is it The Bodzilla or at Bodzilla? It's at The Bodzilla. You nailed it. At The Bodzilla. Excellent. Um, well, we will check out that podcast and we will also follow at the Bodzilla. Thank you so much, April. It's been wonderful Thank to have you on. Thank, Thank you. you.
Hal, do you have anything to plug? Deborah, I have started a podcast of uh, stories for kids. It's called The Story Tailor. And uh, what I do is I get a word or a couple of words or a phrase or a name from a child and then I write a story using those words. And it's for times you're stuck in the car or it's time to go to bed or you just want something um, to occupy your kids. It's the thing I wish someone had done for me when my son was small. So it's called The Story Tailor. Um, I, it's very labour intensive. I didn't think it through, but that <laughs> that is my new podcast. <laughs> well, we look forward to listening to the Story Taylor. And if you've got children, Cal Wilson's got a podcast now. Story Taylor, you will love it. It will distract your children. And what greater feminist gift could she possibly give you? Um, Cal Wilson, it's been absolutely wonderful to have you on today. Thank you so much, Cal Wilson. <laughs> it's been amazing to see you from the shoulders up. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis-White, guest co-host Cal Wilson, our very special guest, Rochelle Panitz and April Elaine Horton. The Guilty Feminist theme tune was composed by Mark Hodge and produced by Nick Sheldon. The producer was Tom Slitsky from the Spontaneity Shop. Thanks to Rachel Croft and Gina Deasy and everyone who made this happen, as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com and don't forget to rate, review and subscribe. Woo! <laughs> was recommended Grace Petrie and Tioni said, oh, you need to listen to The Guilty Feminist and you'll hear Grace Petrie. And so that episode with Grace Petrie was my first one. And so, oh, that's so nice. Yeah, oh, so when Tom sent out the email, I was like, oh, it's come full circle, but then Grace isn't here. So, oh, well, no. we're here. <laughs> Grace couldn't do today. It's a shame. Um, on tour, how rude. Yeah, but also on tour, why she's not she's not got a gig at ten o'clock in the morning. I mean, yeah. get up early, Grace. I mean, her argument will be, oh, I didn't finish my last gig and get back to the hotel and stuff till one and have supper and stuff like that. Whatever, sure. But Grace, where's your commitment to feminism? That's what I would yeah, ask. Exactly. Total, uh, she's turned into a total like cliche of a musician, staying up all night, sleeping all day, not yeah. caring oh, about a- the people. She's a rock star now. She sings a lot of feminist songs, but really, in in what way is that feminist feminism evident? If she can't, she's get a out feminist, of bed? but she won't get up early in the morning to do the bloody <laughs> stuff. Criminal refugees, Chinese survivors, rape survivors. The biggest stars of our headlines are people we rarely actually hear from. Some communities don't get right of reply, and that's just bad journalism. With the mainstream media pushing the same old narratives, what effect does that have on minority groups? From the house of the guilty feminist, we bring you an investigative podcast that starts with the people who are normally asked last. We invite people with lived experience to speak for themselves and roast the headlines that love to roast them. I'm Matilda Mallinson. And I'm Helena Wadia. And, and this is, is Media Storm. I just, I don't see many women of colour getting justice. All they tell me is what's wrong with them. I don't know any different. What the government did and didn't do shows such a severe neglect to the criminal point. Your avoidance of the conversation is part of the silence. I don't know how you, with your eyes, tell someone, like, I'm about to go be murdered. I'm not an idiot to cross the channel while I know it's dangerous. I know it's dangerous. This time they shot at you, maybe next time they uh, attacked you. They sold me and I will kill myself on the wedding day. The damage that was done to my body isn't reversible. I've struggled to get officers to speak on the record about what goes on in prison. We're literally not allowed to. Advocates do not need to be a voice for the voiceless. Survivors have our voice. We are empowered. We are magic. Stop the gatekeeping. Stop censoring people. You don't have a single agent on your entire news. And if you can't find them, you're not doing your fucking job well. You know, it's just, it's so ridiculous. It's like, hey, UK public, should we piss in the sea? Should we put pineapple on pizza? Should we arrange mass deportation flights so as to deny people their full legal rights? That might make it less appealing for refugees to cross the channel. <laughs> Hear our stories. We are the ones who have lived this. Our lived experience is leadership. We are the experts. It's really simple. Just just present both sides of the story. Follow Media Storm wherever you get your podcasts so that you can access new episodes as soon as they drop. You can also follow us on social media 
at Matilda Mal and at Helena Wadia and follow the show via at Mediastorm Pod. Mediastorm, a new podcast from the House of the Guilty Feminist, is part of the ACAST Creator Network. It is produced by Tom Selinsky and Deborah Francis White. The music is by Samfar. The Guilty Feminist is provided exclusively from ACAST. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.